John. Today's goal is so everybody has a sense for what we're going to be talking about. Great. So <clears throat> at the first of the list, we really want to understand the digital threats that are facing our firms. Um, second, we want to discuss how to develop this digital security culture, right? Um, in that light, we also want to talk about how today's client expectations have really shifted and continue to shift um, as we go through time here and as demographics change. And also we'll discuss how Lysio is changing the game uh, with those factors in mind. Um, Darren, what do you think about these? Are we good to go? Yeah, this feels really good, Chris, because, um, you know, the, the very first thing that firms, I think, have to really understand is what is the threat that we're facing today? And, and so many firms really just don't, they, they sort of understand that, but they don't really understand it. And, and it's really about changing your entire culture. Once you understand it, it's about changing your entire culture. Uh, and, and you're doing that at, at a time when clients and staff want more and more access to information, which, you know, inherently goes a, against security sometimes. So we have to talk about all three of those things kind of together. So this, this should be good. That makes sense. There's a natural tension there. And I think a lot of firms are wrestling really with what's the right package. How do we think about it? How we prioritize it? So um, that makes a lot of sense. Let's dive into that a little bit. Um, with regard to um, our first step here, uh, let's start with a polling question to get a sense from the audience of uh, how pervasive that the security problem is for, for firms of all sizes. So um, everybody should see a polling question. If you don't mind, uh, just taking a couple seconds there to, to pick uh, with regard to what percentage of small firms do you think have been breached? It's be interesting to see how this turns out, Chris, because um, I mean, you and I have a pretty good idea what these, what these statistics look like. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the audience thinks. Fantastic. We have to give everybody about five, 10 more seconds here. We think of the idea of a breach. A breach is actually where, where they've compromised your data uh, in some form or fashion, uh, which is you know, a significantly higher bar than just getting an email uh, that looks suspicious. Actually being breached is a, is a higher bar. That's a great point. That's a great point. And I think the stats we're going to talk about in just a second here are for firms that have been breached and the average cost of a breach and what we've seen is just over $100,000 um, per event. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the poll and see what people thought here. All right. Well, I think we have a security-minded audience on our hands here, Darren. Uh, the top result, the winner is greater than 30%. Uh, those of you, who you, of you who picked that are correct. Um, that's what we're seeing in, in practice here. Um, so let's dig into the numbers a little bit more. And I think we have uh, some data that'll help support really who's most at risk and how pervasive the, this really is. So <clears throat> I thought this would be a good slide to start with. This is a slide from the American Bar Association, right? It was published one year ago on December 1st, 2017. And you can find it by searching for ABA Tech Report 2017. Um, now we know this is from the ABA and not the AICPA. But as far as I can tell, the AICPA does not publish comparable data. So we're making the assumption here that law firm breach rates are a relatively good proxy for the CPA profession. Um, so a couple things really stand out. So, so first, it's really this fact that the smaller firms are the most frequently breached, right? So you see that 10 to 49 category checking in with 35%. So, you know, that's really fascinating. Um, now, I think, Chris, with, with this particular slide, uh, I actually think attorney, I mean, attorneys do not have the, the, the wealth of information that accounting firms have, you know, social security numbers and, and uh, income levels and bank account numbers and routing numbers. Just go through the list of all the stuff that criminals want today. I, I, my personal opinion is I think these numbers are low for the accounting profession uh, as a starting point. I think the, the accounting profession is breached at a higher rate. That's, that's really interesting, isn't it? I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where the big guys tend to get all the press on it, right? I think we saw Equifax, we saw Yahoo, today we saw Marriott, Starwood with 500 million. Those guys really get the news coverage, but it seems like the bad guys really know where to go for some bread and butter business. Yeah, and, and you think about that just for a second, a small accounting firm, which you know over 90 plus percent of all firms have fewer than 10 employees. 
and you think about the, the security nature of those firms are, are not very sophisticated because of you know just budget constraints, if, if nothing else. Uh, and then the treasure trove of information that they have makes them just the prime target uh, for bad guys, and bad guys have figured this out. Let's talk about how they figured it out. When we go on to the next, um, the next slide here. So in this case, I think we're looking at an email um, that is a familiar pattern, right? Um, I think the first thing we all notice is that um, this is actually a recent email, uh, relatively recent, from this year. Um, and this one was sent to somebody in your firm, wasn't it, Darren? Can you tell us a little more about it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I think it might be helpful for me, Chris, just to back up a second and, and, and talk about, you know, we were talking about security breaches. And, and the thing about security breaches, uh, we know by statistics that over 91% of security breaches start by somebody inside your firm clicking on an email inappropriately. So whether that's a, uh, a PDF, it's a link, it's something inside of an email that over 91% of all breaches start there. And so the bad guys know that sending out emails uh, are, are how they get access to your information, whether they, they, they drop something on your computer uh, and they start monitoring you. I mean, some statistics that we've seen say that the average criminal spends almost four months on your machine before they ever take an action. Um, so they spend four months watching your behavior, uh, you know, who you email, how you email, how you log into your bank accounts, they're capturing all this data and you have no idea they're even there. So what typically happens is a staff person gets an email just like this, Chris, which, which we get inside of our firm, right? And a staff person looks at that and it looks super real. And they click on that link and nothing happens. Nothing happens. And they think, huh, wonder what the deal was. That link must not have worked. Maybe they click it again. But what really happened is something got loaded on your machine that then starts tunneling its way through your network. It starts looking at what you're logging into and all the things that I just talked about. So criminals have gotten super good at, at knowing the kind of tools, solutions you use inside your firm and then trying to spoof you with those sort of things. I think if we look at the, the next slide, Chris, um, the other thing that's really happened, this is one we just, that just went to uh, uh, me. Uh, the, uh, here's a document that Darren shared with you. So it was going to my partner, uh, Ryan Deckard. And essentially, they had done enough, the, the bad guys had done enough social engineering to know, one, that it was before a conference that, you know, we're having our RootWorks conferences in Florida uh, this week and, and next. And so they, they were aware enough, one, to know Ryan and I are connected, Two, that we're putting together information for our conferences in Florida that were coming up this week. And they start putting these things together. And, and the question is, you know, how do they get this information? Well, they get this information from social media. RootWorks could have posted, hey, we're getting ready for our conferences next week. They, they may have been paying attention to me, paying attention to my partner, Ryan, and saying, hey, both these guys work for uh, the same company and they share information back and forth. And so, so they do a ton of social engineering to figure out who works inside your firm and, and, and what's kind of going on in your life right then. And then they create emails that, that make you not think twice before you click on that. And the thing is, Chris, is, you know, we have nearly 50 people inside of our company and our 50 people have to get every email right every single time in order to prevent something bad from happening. That feels like a super high bar. What do you think? Every email, right? Every single time. I think, I think that's, that's the trick here, right? During, during tax season, for example, the client is sending, how many times is the average tax um, return, you know, creating an interaction with your firm? Multiply that through. Huge number. I just want, I want firms to understand that the, the, the way you get a data breach is, is more than likely going to happen through an email. And more than likely that email is gonna, it's not gonna be something about a Nigerian prince anymore. It's gonna be something super sophisticated that has been socially engineered to get your staff to do something. 
and and that's that's where the threat that's where the biggest threat I that I see right now, Chris, lies. Makes sense. It feels like the cheese has moved, right? It used to be that uh, the bad guys would blow the doors off of bank vaults. It would take them months to go ahead. And there's also parallels here, right? It would take them months to case the bank before they made their move. Yeah. Now, instead of going out there and putting themselves at physical risk, for example, it's much more convenient to stay behind the computer, do the same work, and get the payoff. Um, just a couple of quick follow-up questions here, Darren. Um, how frequent are attacks like this on your firm? Um, daily, every single day. We're, we're getting, so, so we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on. We use a product called Slack internally, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, uh, you know, our staff, every time they get what they believe is a suspicious email with a link or document attached to it, they, they take a screen cap of that and they post it out on Slack. It's every day, uh, multiple times a day. So again, it's pro it is my biggest fear inside of our company, Chris, mm. because I don't know that somebody right now back in our offices in Bloomington are not clicking on something that a criminal is going to sit there for four months and wait and capture information about our company and about me personally and about my staff. And then they're going to execute some sort of cyber crime, some sort of data breach on us that you know, a data breach is not a, is not a single instance. We'll talk again some more about this. It's not a single instance. It's, you get this data breach. Uh, so let's just take Marriott. Okay, I, I'm a big Marriott person. Uh, it, that data breach is going to haunt Marriott for years to come because now they have all this data that they're just going to continue to go out and perpetuate. So it's not a one-time event. Hey, we got our data hacked today, and I'm going to remediate that. My insurance company is going to pay some of the cost of it. That's not what we're talking about. This is going to repeat itself tomorrow and the next day and the next day because these criminals are going to use that data from now on to continue to haunt, haunt Marriott or haunt me in my case. I, I feel that. I'm a Starwood member as well. And I think I was reading something. I, I understand a lot of things are preliminary, but they're suggesting maybe the bad guys have been in there since 2014. Yeah. Um, that's really frightening. What happens? Um, so I think we got your take on, on, on what you, where you see the main risk. Let's go ahead and start another poll here. Uh, with regard to the most common risk areas for firms. So let's give this another 30 seconds or so to run. I think I gave away the answer here, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. We'll check to see if people are listening. <laughs> but we, 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 may, we may challenge this, though, after, uh, after they, uh, they finish this. Fantastic. We'll give another five seconds here, and then let's, uh, let's uncover the results. Last poll, I thought we made too easy. It was like price is right. All you had to do is go one above 30% and you're going to hit it right. Well, I think we also found a, maybe a potentially <laughs> hacked system here in the sense that we have 104%. <laughs> so maybe somebody's, uh, you know, biasing the results in the background. Okay, well, fantastic. Let's go ahead and close that up. And thank you all for responding. That's an incredible response rate. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's talk about this pie chart here. This is um, from a cybersecurity firm, uh, and they're called Proofpoint. Uh, you can find this actually on the web. Uh, we want to credit them for the fine work they've done pulling all this together. Um, what's fascinating here is that people are addressing the security problem using a whole bunch of different solutions, right? We're going to see on here Dropbox. We're going to see um, Google Drive, DocuSign, et cetera, right? <laughs> Um, but it looks like the bad guys are leveraging these tools now as a means to gain entry. So Darren, how is this influencing your thinking with regard to advice that you provide to the firms that you're working with? Yeah, Chris, um, you know, you, you, you think you're being secure by creating a portal. Okay. That, that, that's the first, that's the first thought firms, you know, have gone to over the last, let's call it 15 years. Okay. I'm not going to email a tax return to a client. I'm going to put it in a portal. Uh, maybe I use a product like Dropbox or, or Box or ShareFile or, you know, any, any number of other products that are in this space. But the fallacy in, in that thinking is, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to beat on ShareFile for a moment. The fallacy in that thinking is that I put a document in ShareFile and I send a link through email to a customer and say, click on this so you can go to ShareFile and see your document. Well, the bad guys know that I use ShareFile. They, they have ways of figuring out what solutions that you use. 
they, they know that they now start spoofing you, start spoofing your customers and saying, hey, Darren just sent you a file via share file, click on this link, attacks one of my customers or sends me uh, an email saying, hey, um, client A just sent you a file from Dropbox, click here to go access that. Turns out it wasn't from that client, it was a spoof. So anything in my mind, Chris, right now, what I'm educating to, anything in my mind that relies on email uh, as its primary way of getting into a secured share environment is, is a non-starter. Uh, I'm gonna take and, and, and pick on just a second a solution that I've used for years, DocuSign. Okay, so I wanna get engagement letters signed. We've been getting engagement letters signed, Chris, in our accounting firm for a long time using DocuSign. Mm. But I'm gonna send a DocuSign now agreement out via email. How does my client know whether that actually really came from me or it didn't? Why if somebody's spoofing them? So you can see the fallacy even in the way these solutions were crafted over the last you know, 10, 15 years. They relied on now something that it's highly insecure that the bad guys are spoofing. So I, I think what, what I've been talking to firms a lot about lately, and, um, and we just had it, we, we finished a, one of our conferences yesterday here in Sarasota, and, and I had a whole room of partners that we were, we were talking about this idea that every single technology solution today that a firm looks at or uses or accepts from their customer has to be vetted through a security lens first. You think about that just for a second, every single solution. So there's, there's times when I would have said, yeah, DocuSign looks great. I can get a digital signature on an engagement letter. Let's start using that, right? And, and I wouldn't have thought twice about that. Today, I have to view that through a security lens and say, okay, am I gonna allow one of my clients to share a Google Drive uh, with me? Am I gonna allow that inside my firm? And I have to set it, we'll talk about security culture here in a few minutes, Chris, but I have to think of it from that perspective. Does that make sense? Makes a ton of sense. You know, I, I think there are two things, Darren. I think going back to DocuSign, just for a brief moment, um, in the proof point, uh, materials, DocuSign actually was the most clicked phishing scam. So Dropbox got, had the most attacks or most phishing emails sent, but clients were most vulnerable out of everything on that list to DocuSign. It just felt so right to click it, which is interesting. Um, the second thing is, what you, what you bring to mind, Darren, is you talk about putting everything, all these applications through a security lens. It kind of brings us back to the core of email. Remember e email? I think well, you and I are old enough to remember when it came out is just text transfer. And then it <laughs> well, morphed. You something. are. I'm not quite old enough to remember. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things though, right? Because we, we had email, you know, and it, it's become more robust as the years have gone by. But I think an unintended consequence of that is there's more ways for the bad guys to leverage those convenience features to gain entry to what they want in our worlds. And yeah. I think that's, that's something that I think kind of gets lost in the email story. Yeah. So let's go on to the next, next bit here. Um, so this is, this is an interesting um, bit of, of data. And this is actually, and, and Darren, you'll be able to speak to this much better. But um, my understanding is, you know, you, you have at the firm that you run in Bloomington, you know, an active CPA practice, right? And you've yeah. made investments in headcount and dollars spent, et cetera, time spent to make sure your team stays safe. And I've met Chris, obviously, um, the head of your IT team, and he's run this, um, run these tests. Uh, can you kind of walk us through how longitudinally you've tested things and, and what these results are telling you? Yeah, we use a product. Uh, so Chris Dickens is our CIO and, uh, you know, he, we take security incredibly seriously side of, uh, not only our accounting practice, Root Advisors, but Root Works as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's top of mind for us. One of the things that we've been doing over the last, uh, I'm going to call it 18 months or so, is a lot of education uh, to our staff around being more phishing aware. Uh, and we use a product called Know Before, and that's K-N-O-W-B-E and the number four. Uh, we use that to do simulations, 
uh, you know, and to try to kind of get a, a, a gotcha kind of thing with our staff. You know, Chris will send out emails uh, to our staff that, uh, but when you actually click on them, it pops up and says, hey, we got you essentially. And you, here's why you shouldn't have clicked on this and so on and so forth. Well, Chris was going along pretty happy, uh, thinking that we were doing a really good job uh, sending out some emails. And some of them were like, uh, you know, they seemed obvious to me. They were like, hey, here's a new cookbook and click here if you want to get this recipe. And we have a number of people in our firm that may or may not click that. We were do doing a pretty good job staying around zero on most of those clicks. And I told Chris, I said, you're, you're being too easy on the staff. Bad guys are not going to be that easy. I said, I want you to send one out from me. Uh, saying that we're having a meeting uh, and I want you to click here and pick the best time or something like that to join this meeting. So he sends that out and you can see all of a sudden, boom, we go up to almost 32%. Uh, one out of every three staff people clicking on that. So th this whole idea that you're going to be right 100% of the time, even when you're educating on a regular basis, is not necessarily true. Quick side story, Chris. I, I, we, we, I'll make this one quick. So my, my buddy's the CIO of Indiana University and he's given a keynote um, to all the executives at a retreat. And he, he, his, his idea was he was gonna send out an email the night before to all the executives, which included the president of the university, right? He's gonna send out this email saying, hey, I've changed the agenda. Click here to, to check on the new agenda for tomorrow morning. And then the next morning he was going to present the results at his keynote at, at an opening. You know, there was about 150 IU, you know, from all the vice presidents to the deans and everybody else, 78% click through. Wow. Incredible. So again, this idea we've made our, I've made, made the point, this idea we're going to be right hundred percent of the time is, is just not, not reasonable. Yeah, the social engineering aspect really, really kind of reshapes everything. It does. You know, I know you're making, um, or at least I perceive you're making as large of an investment for a firm your size as anybody out there, I, I would gather. Yeah. Um, so when you're thinking about this, you're making these, you know, you're making these investments. How are you, or how are you thinking about how you're, um, how you're mitigating risk, right? Because I think a lot of firms out there have thought, hey, maybe my insurance will cover something if it happens, et cetera. So how do you, how do you view financial risk, reputational risk, et cetera? You know, the, the financial risk uh, is certainly something that I, I'm concerned with. You know, we, we, we carry liability, you know, security or fiber insurance like everybody else. I, I'm not sure how much it covers when push comes to shove. I mean, if we were actually negligent in what we did, is it still going to cover? So, you know, I, I'm less concerned about the financial risk for me because I, I, I think that we can, I think that our insurance covers it, but I don't know that to be true. I'm more concerned about the reputational risk. Um, I'm more concerned about this uneasiness that, you know, somebody's just broken into my house and now they have the keys and I can't change the locks. And I have to go home every night wondering whether somebody's still there or getting back in. So those are the things that weigh on me more, even than the financial side of this. The financial is significant, but it's, it's the, uh, I don't know, it's just this whole breach thing. It just feels violated. I, I, you know, it, it feels like you get violated in this process. And I've talked to, man, Chris, probably 40 firms uh, in the last year that have been breached. And they all tell me the same thing. They, one, they, they tell me it costs about 180 grand and their insurance covers some of it, uh, a decent portion of it, but not all of it, but it's the violation. Uh, it's the not knowing it was the reputational risk that really scared them more than anything else. That's, that's very interesting. That's, that's very interesting. I, th I think it leads us kind of where we're going next, which is, I, I don't think any of us want to get breached. I mean, that's obvious, right? So let's talk about this culture of security that you're really you know, bringing to the top of mind um, across the fir your firm and the firms you work with? Every firm, every firm that's listening, every firm out there has a security culture. It could be bad. It could be really strong. It could be somewhere in between. So I like to think of it as everybody has a security culture today. It may be one that we're not educating or doing everything through email 
uh, we're not paying attention. So, so on a scale of zero to 10, maybe your security culture is a 0.5, but you have a security culture, whatever it is today. Maybe you're, you know, in our case, I, I think our, our security culture over the last couple of years has been greatly heightened. And I feel like we have a strong security culture. Does that mean that we're not going to get violated or breached? No, but it means we're paying really close attention to it. And we're, we're making decisions. We're making moves to bring us, to bring our, to, to bring our security culture up. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, it really does. It really does. And I, I think, you know, just from a market awareness perspective, you know, we're, I think we are all um, consumers of everybody else's security measures as well, whether it's with our attorney, whether it's with all these partners. I, I go back to the Marriott thing. I, I've been a Starwood member forever. I don't know what to do at this point, right? Do I give up my loyalty to them? I'm certainly not happy. But I think there's this whole notion that people are becoming more and more aware as to what good security looks like and having a sense of whether or not they're getting good security, right? I get a lot of emails, ADP, for example, sends me one that says, hey, don't click on anything in this unless you know the sender and you know it's safe. I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to go to swimming without getting wet. They're just sending me the email in the first place. Yeah. That, that part seems tough. You know, we, we see, we're, we're in the financial sector with our accounting firm. We see other financial sector companies that are dealing with this head on and, and changing behavior with customers. So one of the things, and I'm, I'm gonna use Chase Bank as an example, and how they have, have uh, over time increased their security culture. There was a time when I could have called my local banker and shot them an email and they would have asked me to give them financial information and we would have exchanged this data back and forth. That does not happen anymore. I did a mortgage this last year, Chris. Mm. Uh, they will not do anything with me over email. They've changed their security culture. You have to operate inside of, of their environment or they're not going to communicate with you about financial. I, I couldn't even ask about a credit card because uh, I was moving some cards to them. Uh, it had to be, I mean, through email, it had to be inside their secure platform. Schwab's the same way, Fidelity's the same way. All the big guys have really changed behavior because they've, they've increased their security culture and they've moved to secure sharing platforms inside of their sort of point to point communication, if you will. It's the small guys, it's the main street that's been unable to do this so far. But what, what some of the big guys moving this way tells me is that customers will adopt if they're being led to a better security culture. I know that Chase is not gonna communicate with me via email and I'm happy about that now, right? So when I look at that, I look inside my own accounting firm and say, you know, I, client behavior will change if I lead them. The same as Chase has led me, the same as Schwab has led me. My client's behavior will change. It, I can move them out of email if I have a tool to do so. Well, I think you're actively doing that already, aren't you? Let, let's take a look at, um, at, at the next slide here because I, I think you're using this as a security is a known quantity that you can use to actually drive growth. Isn't that what we're seeing here? This, this, is, an ad, this is an ad, Chris, uh, that we ran in our local magazine for Bloomington is called Bloom Magazine. And it's a cool magazine for the city of Bloomington. And we, we are taking out half page ads as an accounting firm and saying, hey, we take data security seriously. Because people are seeing on the news that the Marriott's are getting hacked or the targets are getting hacked. They wanna know that their data is more secure. So we're seeing this as, uh, as an opportunity to differentiate us from other accounting firms. Other accounting firms are not advertising this kind of stuff. You can go to the next one, and this is another ad that we, we ran. Again, we're keeping your data secure by keeping it out of email. We're educating the marketplace and saying, hey, we do this differently. We've had, I, I don't know why, but we've had our best two years ever uh, in growth in the accounting firm. Is it because of ads like this? I don't know. Is it because we're very tech savvy? Maybe, but it's, I think it's all the above. But we're, we're making a point to tell the community, hey, we do things differently. We take your security seriously. Go, go to the next one, Chris. It's kind of interesting. It's, uh, this was one where we said, hey, here's all the things. We train our staff. You know, we put everything up in the cloud. Uh, we, we take things out of email. We use two-factor authentication. 
these are just these are just evolutions of ads that we've done to to more and more educate the community on how we take security seriously. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense, Darren. I, I think what we're seeing also in, in the firms that we're engaged with, there's two factors, right? I think there's this demographic shift. A lot of boomers are retiring in the next five years. Are, we're going to see, you know, a dramatic change, and people are knowing they have to fill the gap in business with a technology savvy audience. Second thing we're seeing is the leadership inside of firms is also getting younger and they want to be a little bit more progressive. So those two factors combined firm and client side seem to be, you know, you know, really, really kind of taking hold there. You know, in the, uh, in the old days, Chris, people thought uh, the banks thought security was taking their money and sticking it into a vault and locking that vault and and nobody was going to get to that and and you know for the most part they were ex exactly right they took their their money they put it in a vault and it was it was pretty secure unless somebody really wanted to get in there today we can't take our stuff we can't take our tax terms and our financial statements and all this stuff and put them in vaults anymore because people want access and with access comes security risks so we're we're we're, we're trying to balance convenience mobile with security. And the question always is, you know, how do you, how do you do that effectively? Right. If you felt it's always felt like an or rather than an and maybe, yeah. well, let's take a look at, I know you've been walking this path, Darren, you and the firm have been walking this path for a while now. Let, let's, let's kind of take a look at your progression in terms of your um, communication yeah. diet, so to speak. Well, you know, back back in 2015, we, we were an email centric firm. Um, so I went to Chris Dickens, our CIO, and I said, Chris, you know, all these statistics are telling me that 91% of security breaches start with the click of an email and are, we're, we're email centric on everything we're doing. We're emailing clients, we're emailing each other inside the firm. Um, email is everywhere. I mean, I was getting, at one point, maybe 350, 400 emails a day. My staff were getting a lot of emails. And so this, is, this was kind of our, our 2015 communication. This is how we were communicating. We were using Zoom. We had just started using Zoom. So by and large, we were meeting with our internal staff people at that time uh, via Zoom. So that was a portion of our communication, but the rest of it was all email. So Chris and I sort of set out on a path and said, how can we the, the way we reduce risk is, is by reducing email, is, is what we thought. So you can see, you go to the next slide, we implemented a tool called Slack. Uh, and Slack is arguably the tool, one of the tools inside of our firm that we would last want to get up, give up because we communicate so effectively. Think of it as an internal uh, communication platform, point-to-point uh, -point communication platform that allows me and my staff to all communicate. But what was interesting, when we went to Slack in uh, early, I think we went to Slack in late 2016. Uh, by 2017, one of the things that we noticed was 74% of our communication that was even taking place inside of our, you know, in, in that whole uh, circle, 74% of it was mostly internal, people emailing each other. Well, just by removing that one piece out of, or adding this tool Slack and removing uh, internal communication out of our communication profile, you can see that our risk factor has now dropped significantly. So now I'm dealing with 91% of 21% instead of 91% of 90%, right? So you can start seeing our risk profile going down. And then if you go on to 18, you know, as we implemented Lizio, you can see now we're communicating with our customers in point to point instead of going through email. So we were so successful with Slack communicating internally, we said, you know, we need to act like the big guys. We need to act like Chase and, and communicate with our customers in the same way. And we implemented Lizio to do that. And you can see now our, our email communication inside of our firm is down to 2% this year. So now we're, our risk profile has gone from 91% of 90% to 91% of 2%. Does that make sense? That's, that's extraordinary, Darren. I think a couple of things come to mind. One is you're taking certainly what would be considered 
um, back then or even now, a radical and perhaps heretical concept. And you're walking a path. You know, you're walking a path that is getting you to n not necessarily overnight, but over a period of time to where you want to be. I think that's, that's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. You, you can either sit there and do nothing and hope nobody clicks on anything, or you can do something about it. And we, we have just chosen to, to be as uh, uh, forward thinking as we could possibly be on this, Chris, because I, I'm not good at sitting there doing nothing about it, nor, nor are you. Um, we, we've got to actively try to make this better because we, we do not believe the security threat is going to go down uh, next year even. My, 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 my buddy that was the CIO of IU uh, came and gave a speech to our uh, academy conference this past year in, in Florida. And his speech was, if you think it's bad now, wait till next year. <laughs> so uh, I think he was right. Now. Yeah. I think he was right. He's proven, proven. That's fantastic. Let, let's go on. I think we have another, um, another slide or two probably here. Yeah. I'll go through these real quick, Chris. It's, um, you know, the, the, the third uh, thing on our agenda was how expectations are shifting. Um, you know, no longer do we want documents sitting in a vault somewhere. We, we want things on our phone. And there's this whole idea that uh, security is extremely important, um, but I want convenience. So how do I get the, how do I marry those two things? Because I personally believe, and, and I'm sure you do as well, that I want everything that I can get and consume on my mobile device. I believe that the mobile device is the new front door to the practice. So then how do we build out a, um, a model, if you will, uh, to communicate with our customers and, and make our customers better while all along making them secure. And what I've really kind of shown you here is that a modern experience starts with mobile security, you know, top of mind, educating customers how to use this and what best practices are. And here's the things around it that they largely want to be able to do on their mobile device. If you hop to the next uh, image, Chris, kind of gives you an idea. In, in the morning, th this happens to be my phone, but I can, I can do everything from my mobile device. I can check my bank account and see if anything's happened. I can get my investments updated. Every document I have in my entire world is in Google Drive. I communicate with customers in Lizio. Uh, I can check our financials using QuickBooks. I get my paycheck stub and all that through ADP Run Wholesale. I can approve bills in bill.com and even ex submit expense reports if I want through Expensify. Everything in my financial world's on my phone. Everything in my financial world is two-factor authentication, meaning that there has to be two things uh, that I, it's something, something I know like a password or facial ID along with a device I have on me that's two-factor authentication, I've got it turned on on all these. So I really have access to everything and I've enhanced my security. Does that make sense? It really resonates well with me. And it, it might only just barely justify a thousand dollar mobile phone price today. <laughs> I, I have the, the, the Max now, the, the iPhone 10 Max, which I'm pretty happy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it is a computer now, isn't it? It is. Um, well, that's really good. That's really good. So I think I think that's, um, at this point, I think we have uh, an opportunity to probably go in and show people a little bit about, you know, at least the, uh, the Lissio aspects here. Uh, but before we do that, we have a uh, quick, another quick poll. I think this is our last one. Uh, let's go ahead and put that on the screen. All right, so what steps will you take this year to improve the security of your clients and your firm? So we'd want to get a sense of what people are up to. Um, we'll give us another five, 10 seconds here. I think when we hop into a demo here in a minute, Chris, uh, people will get a better sense of how uh, we're able to solve via Lizio for some of the email and file sharing and, and really the mobile convenience factor while being highly secure. Uh, don't want to skew anybody's thing. Yeah, maybe we should re, re poll after. Yeah. <laughs> <But anyway. laughs> All right, let's go ahead and close this one up, and um, I will take uh, control here. All right. 
So let's see, you're about to see uh, my desktop here. And what I want to do is just take a couple of quick minutes to introduce those of you who haven't seen Listio before to what the platform does. And I think um, <clears throat> just from a background perspective, um, obviously working in close concert with Darren, uh, Darren's firm, and now uh, roughly 300 firms, we've been getting a lot of feedback in terms of what um, the profession really wants to see here. And we're really focused on the accounting profession at large. So when you think about a forcing function for what features we build or how people are going to interact, this is really the result of uh, what we believe is a lot of the, the best thinking um, out there. And what we wanted to do was, <clears throat> it was, was we had a clarion call for this from, from the base, which is it really, really has to be adoptable by firms and by the clients. So what I really want to show you today is the fact we're going to be walking through a bunch of recognizable patterns that feel really comfortable and that really lower the barrier or the hurdle to getting active adoption. So <clears throat> let's start um, with this and, and um, we're gonna stay pretty high level here, but this is a firm view. So when firms log in, they'll see a dashboard. And the dashboard really has a sidebar with a lot of things you would anticipate seeing, you know, accounts, contacts, all the, all the general information is here. But <clears throat> the primary focus is on the inbox and on tasks that are outstanding. And so an inbox is gonna look and feel an awful lot like email. So I can create a message very quickly if I just tap on this. <clears throat> I'm gonna go into a light box. This feels nice and comfortable. I can send this to a client. I'm gonna send this to Christine. And Christine is automatically associated with an account. If there's multiple accounts that Christine has, maybe multiple businesses, et cetera, we'll have a drop down here for you. But in this case, Christine just works on the tally account. If I put a subject line in here, um, great news, come visit us or call soon. Okay, <clears throat> I just want to get this out to her. What will happen is we talked about kind of being in a digital universe. What you're going to see over here is this is um, my live phone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and send that to the client. Chris, a couple of points as you're pulling up your, your phone to show. Um, What's happening here is we're, we're, we have a point-to-point -point communication. So this is not an email that goes all over the place. This is a point-to-point. -point. Christine's been invited into the platform. This is a point-to-point -point communication. So you can trust anything in this, in this message. If there's a link in there or anything else, you can trust this. Uh, and I think that's, that's super important uh, to make note of. That's right, that's right, Darren. Thank you for pointing that out. This is an invite only invite only network. So unlike our phones or email accounts where anybody in the world can robocall us or spam email us or do something even worse, this is only the people that you've invited in can interact with you. So, the second and, point I was going to make on that too, Chris, is you picked Christine client and she's associated with Tally in this particular case. Now all communications across the firm you know, it is now tied to an account called Tally that go to Christine in this particular case. So people across the firm can have some transparency. So sorry about that. That's great. Let, let's dig into that. So <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm logged in as Christine here on my mobile device and she immediately gets a mobile notification. In fact, my watch, my Apple watch just buzzed saying I got something. So you can log in right on her phone as, as she wants to do. And she can go ahead and reply to us just as if she's messaging. It looks and feels an awful lot like a text message, right? I'll stop by tomorrow. Okay, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and send that back to her. And the firm immediately gets it. So point to point, just like as if it's messaging, right? Well, fantastic. <clears throat> so I look at that and say, great, I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna go ahead and archive that message. So Darren was mentioning earlier that we can go ahead and see everything across the firm. So <clears throat> if I'm having this interaction, but Darren wants to see what's going on, let's say Christine calls and I'm not in the office, what he can do is he can either look up Christine by name or by account. So if I, for example, he picks up the phone and says, hi, Christine, uh, Chris isn't here, but I can help you. He can quickly type in Christine <clears throat> and he immediately has access to all the tasks, all the messages and all the notes that are happening with her account. So tasks means it's something that Christine owes us that she um, needs to get back to us. And you know, you know how this would work in an email. Clients are constantly losing things that you need from them in the email stream. What if you could actually break that out and make it specific? So the tasks I see here, 
assigned to Christine client, we have one task for her. And we also have one attached to me for this account. So you can see internal tasks for a client and external. Um, she can see it. If I go back to the home screen, she'll see in her tasks right here. She has one open task. So it's parallel. You, can, you know exactly what's outstanding. So Darren quickly say, hey, Christine, we have uh, an information request out for you. Um, we need your bank statement for October. Can you get that to us? So even though he doesn't work on this account, he has visibility into what's owed. <clears throat> he can also go into messages and see everything that's gone before. So you can see Christine Klein says, I'll stop by tomorrow, right? He can see the full communication string. So if he wakes up in the middle of the night saying, did we ask for or did we send such and such to Christine? Easily done there. It can be done by person or by account. So point to point messaging, totally transparent with uh, um, obviously a mobile experience and an in-browser experience that clients um, will really love. So that's really kind of the high level on Lysio and what we're doing. Chris, kind of the question I, I get a lot is what's the difference between a message and a task? And just from my perspective, uh, they're, they're very similar, um, but there, there's these things inside of our firm that I, I like to think of, of tasks as managing uh, those things that go from the firm out to the customer. Oftentimes we manage our own workflow in our back office using our, using our practice management system, but we never have the ability to manage communication from the firm out to the customer. So I like to think of a task as something that we need to, to keep on our radar uh, and follow up on. Say, it may be I sent a, a, a task to a client to get me a copy of their K-1 or their driver's license, and I want them to attach that and send it back. It's something that's trackable uh, that I want to pay attention to. A message is, is maybe less trackable in that I need to, to keep it on my radar, but it's just saying, hey, your tax turn's ready. Uh, things like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's having that punch list for your client yeah. um, that you can actually maintain in concert with them. It, it, it seems that seems to be such a strong thing. I think, you know, when you get to the things, why is this different than a Slack or why is this different from, you know, uh, just regular email? It's the fact that instead of a stream of consciousness, everything is really well organized and it helps actually helps keep the client on track as well. So that's been a big, big time saver. So what um, we're solving for here, Chris, is this, this security issue of point-to-point -point communication, right? Um, tracking tasks, but also creating transparency across the organization. So everybody, you know, email is such a siloed, um, such a siloed thing uh, where a product like Lizio now communication is, 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 you can see it across the entire firm. That's right. That's right. And it's in a package that we think at this point, having you know been around a few iterations with this, it's at the point now where it's so easily adoptable um, by people in the firm and by clients externally, um, just because it is, again, it's kind of respecting those patterns that have gone before, and it has a context of security and convenience that people can really get behind. So, um, so I want to kind of throw that out there just as a, a little bit of a teaser today. And I know, do know we've had some, some questions come in, so I'm thinking, we might want to um, change gears a little bit here and, uh, and take a look at what we have in the Q&A section. Fantastic, so give me a second here. Da, da, da. We have, um, <clears throat> we have a, a quick question from, um, when will the firm side app be available for firm employees. We actually have that in development right now. We're looking at the first quarter. So what people want to do, what firm employees want to do is be able to go around and be able to respond to messages right from the old device. Right now, the firm uh, app, or pardon me, the firm experience is all in browser. So we'll be bringing that to you guys probably within the next 90 days or so. So we're already in development there. And that's, uh, that's from chat. The other nice thing about that, Chris, is, you know, just the ability to, you know, I'll have all my contacts, all my accounts in there. I can just click and call. I can respond to messages. I can see message history. Yeah, I'm super jazzed about that as well. So, yeah, um, Joanne Bakovich is asking about um, links for webinars. So, can we send links to webinars and put them in? Yes, we're adding. Um, you can send a, a hot link through Lysio to your clients. So now you can get those through. Um, let's see. Another one we have here. What's the most secure way to roll this out to clients, right? Because you're inviting them through email. Right? And what if they're being monitored by a hacker and know this is a program that's being used? Does this create a risk? That's a really good one. I like that one. Darren, you want to take a first swipe at that? Oh, 
I, you give me the hard ones. <laughs> um, I have some best practices. I can go through those too. So do, do, do your best practices. Okay. So number one, I think um, when firms begin to roll this out, there's a couple things that happen. Number one is we think the easiest way to go is when you have somebody and, and most firms aren't going hundred percent right away, but most firms are to come visit you. Firms when they come in are the first thing they're doing is saying, Hey, we got this app to sit down with me, right? So whether it's a prospect or an existing client, you immediately get them on. So every interaction that you're doing is you are, um, you're inviting them to do that. The second thing is when you send an invitation out to them, right, uh, to clients, what we're doing is we're trying, it comes in all of our materials, we're helping them to educate clients to never click on a link. So if you're on the phone with them or on email, what you always say is go to da 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 dot listio dot me. That's not entirely unspoofable. The bad guys kind of sitting there watching. We hope they're not. But in general, it's the education process begins now. And, you know, presumably, presumably, you know, not too many bad guys are watching, watching us yet. So anyway, I'll leave it there. Anything to add there, Darren? I, I don't think so. You know, as far as how to get people on, our, our success has been in our firm, Chris, is uh, every new prospect, every new client, we've we just tell them, hey, here's how we communicate. And we get them on the platform right then. That, that, that is just simple. Um, we have been extremely successful over the last uh, 60 days getting all of our business customers, uh, like our client accounting clients in there. So I think we have nearly 300 of those now using the system actively every single day. We've chose to, to not um, hammer on our 1040 clients quite yet. We'll start hammering them about the 5th of January is our plan right now and getting our 1040 clients in. There's just not a lot of communication happening with our 1040 clients at the moment since we're past October 16th. Um, but our plan is to have all of our 1040 clients on certainly some, you know, through, through busy season. This is a pro anytime you roll out something new, Chris, it's a process. It's not a, hey, I, I do this and it's all over. No, it's, this is a process of education and, and it requires a commitment, it, it, it requires a bigger why. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I'm trying to keep people secure. That's why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I want to keep our firm and our clients secure. And then I, then, then you just go through change management at that point. I like it. I like it. Um, let's see if another one. So uh, I'll, I'll tee this one up and I'll take a first whack at it. But it looks as if we have another Slack user in the audience that knows that Slack isn't great. And the, the quote is, I worry about using Slack for communicating with staff about clients and then losing track of needing to get something done. And I think what we're seeing for clients using Slack and Lysio is if you have some high velocity, just, you know, keep you in the loop stuff that goes through Slack. But we have a feature in Lysio called to do's. And when we were looking at the task list for Christine client on tally earlier in the demo, we had two tasks there. One was for the client. And the other one was for another person in the firm. So if we have something that is going to be task oriented, client facing task oriented, you can use Listio to do's, or you can use something in your practice management back office workflow. Both are acceptable. Is that, is that on point Darren or? Yep. I think it's exactly on point. Um, you know, we, we see all of our just sort of chatter running through Slack and kind of keeping people up to date. But when we really need to do something on a client, we use Lizio and use our to-dos and we, we track through that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, this is a great question and I think we'd need to think about this, but um, can you send Google and Outlook calendar invites through Lizio? If it's a link, you can send links. So you can do it that way. Just go ahead and take the link and paste it. That would be easy. So we recommend that. Oh, I have, I have one of the favorite ones for here for you, Darren. You're going to like this one. Can you sign 8879s? In Lysio? Um, you can't. Um, we, 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 I mean, this is not the first time we've heard this one. <laughs> um, we are currently not signing 8879s. We, we debated it hard uh, as to whether we want to have the client, you know, go through knowledge based authentication, uh, you know, for taxpayer and spouse and the complexity of all of that. Um, some firms have had real good success in, in using KBAs and getting those signatures, but the vast majority of firms have not been able to roll out that out very successfully across the firm. Right now, what we're seeing is what makes the most sense, at least for our firm, is 
we're going to send that 8879 through Lizio, uh, and we're going to ask the client just to print that out, sign it, take a picture of it, and send it back to us. That that feels like less of a burden. I know it's not the most tech savvy component, um, but it's sometimes um, just simple. You know, just just being simple is 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 the is the best thing to do with customers. Um, so I don't know what's your take on that, Chris. I think I think we've had. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the majority of firms are <clears throat> have a risk with 8879s, which is clients don't always have the best experience there because you have to do both spouses in many cases. And if one of them doesn't get the questions right, then you end up you know kind of in a bit of a pickle. So we've had good success with our firms just you know print, sign, take a photo using the Lysio app. That's really that's really quite good um, for most. But for firms who do want to have the next level bit, we are looking, we're actively investigating, and most um, companies such as DocuSign have open APIs available that allow us to completely, um, essentially circumvent the email loop. So you'll be able to call the DocuSign document experience directly from Lysio, send the document through Lysio, and get it back. So I think we'll see that. It's again, kind of goes back to the force of, of large numbers, the profession kind of saying this. But we prioritize our, our roadmap very carefully around messaging first because that's a convenience piece. But the security component that we're seeing, you know, we, the large bills and the, and the frequency of firms getting hacked has been, um, that's been the primary concern for us. You know, Chris, as well as I do, we, we constantly have to keep bringing people, firms back to one question. Why do you want to implement a tool like Lizio? And, and the biggest why that you can answer for yourself is because I need to be doing secure communication with my customers. That's your biggest why. Because the kind of questions that we get after that are, well, is, is, this, is this box, do you, have, you guys have this check box? Or again, 8879 is a big one, I get that. But is, is, that, is, that, a bigger, is that a bigger challenge than getting insecure emails? Or sending out links through messages back and forth with customers or sharing files and having my staff click on links from Dropbox box or you know any of these things. Just always keep in mind what you're really trying to solve for. And what we're really trying to solve for is secure, secure communication. We will continue to add these other layers to this, but what we're really trying to solve for well today is secure communication. I like that. And with that, I wanna, um, we should probably draw things to close here. Um, it is uh, just after the hour, just after the hour. So I know there's a couple more questions been rolling in, but uh, we're happy to talk to you about those probably after, after the session. Um, just make sure you reach out to us. Uh, we're available on the web at lisio.me, obviously. Um, Darren, uh, myself, the team will be able to respond to you. Uh, but we want to thank you all very much for your interest. And, and Darren, any closing comments from you? No, I'm just glad that people are paying attention to security. Um, I'm, I'm trying to stand at least on my soapbox and yell out that this is a major problem. But I just want uh, everybody listening to know that you, you, can't pass, you can't be a passive or you can't be passive in this situation. You, you have to start developing a, a security culture and you have to understand what that means. Fantastic. I, I think uh, just to add on to that, the security culture that we're bringing to our clients is something that they will adopt, right? I saw another question is kind of flip in about, can, how do you stop people from using other things? We educate. I think we are known as a profession as being um, tremendous educators and kind of showing people the way. So we've seen great result um, as that's happened. So um, thank you everybody. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, being here. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Yeah, thanks Chris. Signing off, thank you Darren.